Shall I just dive right in since we've, you know, we've lost some time? Yeah. Okay. Well, welcome back, everyone. I'm, I, I'm, I'm hoping that many of you were there for part one. I did have a poll question, uh, but uh, we will pass on it just because of the uh, time factor. And here are my objectives for day, today. We are really going to look at behavioral health interventions and then some local resources. Next slide. So again, I'm not going to go over this for all of you who came last time. We talked about uh, the six parts of the brain and depending on where the injury happens, uh, you know, certain aspects of functioning get affected or it could be quite global. So uh, I know some of you may be joining us for the first time. Uh, I'm sorry that I can't spend too much time on this, but you will be getting my slide deck. Next slide. And so here, <clears throat> this is what the brain picture you just saw. Uh, for example, if your cerebellum was uh, was uh, injured, uh, it would affect your coordination, your balance, your equilibrium, and your reflex. And if you if if it is your occipital lobe, uh, then your vision is affected. So very practical uh, to really take a look at it and ask your clients. You know, where did your injury occur? Do you know which part of your brain was most impacted? Next slide. And so last time, last Tuesday, we talked about uh, mental health, you know, the, uh, the impact of uh, um, uh, mental health on, on traumatic brain injury. Uh, so, uh, so it's very common to have uh, psychiatric sequelae long term. And it can be anything from depression to anxiety to PTSD, uh, you know, high rates of suicide and, of course, substance abuse. Next slide. And so two big changes in people who have a traumatic brain injury. One is behavioral disturbance. Uh, it could be they're more impulsive, they're most they're more aggressive, they're most they're more disinhibited. They may have sleep problems, uh, and they may just appear kind of uh, uh, apathetic and kind of disengaged. Those are kind of very visible. Uh, behavioral changes, which come because of damage to your brain. Remember the story I told you all about Phineas G uh, Gage, how his personality was totally changed after his injury. Next slide. And then there are cognitive changes, uh, direct changes that happen to your brain. And it can be any of these things, memory, a language, uh, visual, spatial, executive function, social interactions, all of that can be affected uh, because of absolute damage to the brain. So there are those behavioral changes and then there are those cognitive changes. And then on top of that, you can, you can layer uh, the mental health, uh, um, either new mental health diagnoses or they had previous mental health diagnoses, which just get more exacerbated. Next slide. So, so we are here to see how do you really work as a mental health provider? How do you work with someone with a traumatic brain injury? Remember, due to cognitive and behavioral impairment, as a result of the damage to the frontal parts of the brain, remember, what is the fingerprint of uh, TBI? Is front of the brain injury, frontal lobe. Uh, so individuals with a history of brain injury may have difficulty knowing what the problem is, why, why they're there to see you. Having difficulty with changing or monitoring their behavior having difficulty with accessing service like navigation. It's difficult for all of us with intact brains sometimes to navigate our complex systems of care. Imagine if you have cognitive compromise. So yes, they have a hard time navigating services and very hard time remaining engaged in services and treatment. You know, they come and go. And that can be very frustrating to all, all of you providers and clinicians. Next slide. So what are the barriers? And this is over and over and over again, the literature, um, you know, um, 
points this out, lack of experienced behavioral health staff. That means who have experience working with people with traumatic brain injury and resources. So people, clinicians and professionals don't understand and don't know how to adjust their approaches. So really that lack of experience. Misinterpretation of symptoms of TBI, you know, and very easily labeling them, you know, as, you know, non-compliant, lazy, they don't come regularly, they miss their appointments, why are they here, uh, you know, uh, and not really understanding that their brain is damaged. Really very little kind of resources out there which provide the kind of rich rehabilitation environment or long-term environment for people who are experiencing a tremendous uh, you know, uh, impacts of brain injury. And then very commonly, discontinuation of treatment before goals are met. You all have policies. If the person misses three appointments, we are going to close him. We will discharge him. Or he never shows up for every second uh, appointment. We are going to discharge him. He never follows through. We are going to discharge him. Without really understanding that maybe this kind of lack of engagement could be part of his traumatic brain injury. So what happens is we prematurely close them, uh, close them to services. And guess what? They cycle back through different systems, uh, different systems of, of care or encounter law enforcement or jail and prison. Next slide. So we, all of us on this call today, we need to really look at ourselves and say, what skills are we lacking? And really, how do you evaluate your client's history of brain injury. And that was really session one last week when we talked about the importance of asking and screening. And secondly, how do you accommodate whatever therapy you're offering for people with cognitive and executive functioning impairments? So there is no magic bullet that uh, if you thought I was going to teach you one particular clinical intervention or one particular modality that works with, with people with trauma, traumatic brain, no, nope. it's everything you do with other, other clients, you do with people with traumatic brain injury too. Next slide. And so here's my question. Have you adapted? and accommodated your approach to meet the needs of people with cognitive disabil uh, difficulties? Have you? Now, imagine if someone came into your office with a broken leg. You, you, uh, and you were putting on a social event. They could barely walk with a crutch or they're in a wheelchair, you would not put them in a race where they have to run, correct? You're going to accommodate for that and say, hey, we will have a race with wheelchairs. That is an accommodate. I'm giving you a really grossly simple, uh, simple example. You know, you will put them in a wheelchair race. What have you done? You have accommodated then why would we not accommodate our mental health therapies, our mental health interventions, our mental health intakes for people with neurocognitive problems? Next slide. And why should you do it? Because disability rights are civil rights. People with disabilities are protected under law. Uh, how many of you know of the ADA, the Americans with Disability Act? It's well over 20 years old, where we it's incumbent on us to adjust and adapt our programs and our environments to serve people with disabilities. So what does it mean to accommodate? Provide services in a manner that takes into consideration that client with traumatic brain injury special needs. And it provides an opportunity to address barriers so that 
the person with the traumatic brain injury has an opportunity to be successful in treatment. If you don't, what's going to happen is you're going to discharge them after the first two missed appointments. That is not an accommodation. And in a way, you are violating that person's civil rights. Next slide. So because of time, I'm not going to go over this, but I have put together this list uh, of what are some cognitive areas that get affected, which you should be aware of so that you know how to adapt your treatment. Attention, for example, aside from being awake and alert, it is one of the most important cognitive abilities to be able to pay attention and concentrate on important things or important messages or trainings that you're giving. It is a very basic uh, thinking ability. And imagine if that is affected. What should you be doing as a therapist, clinician, case manager in behavioral health? Similarly, I have given you all the other areas that are affected. Uh, one thing, uh, one is processing speed. You know, people who get brain damage sometimes have a hard time processing information in snap in you know one second they may take longer to process you may ask them a question you may have to wait maybe a minute for them to process it to give you an answer how do you think you have to adjust your schedule and your intervention with someone who's having processing speed problems and attentional problems next slide similarly there are other areas, so there are eight areas affected. So please take time to read them uh, when, uh, you know, when you get the slide deck. Next slide. So what should you do? First, treat symptoms that are causing the most distress to the person. Target symptoms that immediately affect daily function and quality of life. And always, always build hope and self-efficacy. You can do it. I'm glad you are here. Uh, uh, promoting hope. Do you know it's one of, uh, it is an independent predictor of therapy success. How hope is, how hope is communicated to the client or the patient. And that, that sense that you can do it, I'm here to coach and help you. That's what self-efficacy is. So how do you communicate that to a person who has, everywhere he has gone, people have thrown him out, you know, after two sessions or three sessions. How do you communicate that? I'm glad you're here. I'm going to work with you. I understand your disability. I want to help you and I know you can get better. That's what building hope and promoting efficacy is. Next slide. Treat first what you know, any kind of pre-existing psychiatric uh, disorders, any kind of new disorders like PTSD and depression, substance abuse, and also function symptoms that are interfering like headaches, pain, insomnia. So yes, you may have to do very close coordination, say with the neurologist or their primary care uh, physician, because if they're in pain, they have headaches, uh, they are having vision problems. How are they going to engage with you? If you are not talking and consulting with other medical providers. So yes, care coordination becomes really, really important. Next slide. And remember the emotional impact. Remember last time I showed you a slide on the lived experience of someone with a traumatic brain injury. Brain injury can change everything a person relies on to define themselves within a flash of a second. Everything changes. Imagine one of you today. You are in a car, you were in a car accident coming to this training. And in an instant, your life changed. 
You could be paralyzed from the neck down. You may have severe damage to your brain. You may need to be tube fed. Can you imagine in a flash all of that changes? Not just physically. In addition, dreams, plans are forever altered for that person. And it's like rebuilding your life from scratch. Now, can you put hope in that context? How important that is uh, to communicate that hope to the person? Next slide. I'll let you know that we're at the halfway mark right now. Okay, thank you. So really accommodation, accommodation, accommodation. No two injuries are alike. Changing the way services are delivered can reduce the impact of the impairment. And so I want to introduce this concept of cognitive load. Remember these two words, cognitive load and cognitive compensation. Okay. In your work with people with traumatic brain injury. Next slide. So what is this cognitive load? Have you ever been to a course where the trainer went through material so quickly that you barely learned a thing? I hope I'm not doing that today, though I am in a way because of our technical difficulties. Or maybe the content was so complex that it went completely over your head. Lately, I'm, I'm you know, I, I, I got this in my head. You know, I love physics but i my 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 literacy in figure uh, physics is like about this much and so i decided to hey i want to learn more about string theory and quantum physics so i, I began watching some shows you know on television and let me tell you halfway through my brain was in a fog i could barely understand the content and so I said, oh, no, I need to find a book of a, a physics for dummies because this is going way over my head. And I had cognitive, the cognitive load was too much for me to understand. Now, imagine that happening every day with your client with traumatic brain injury. Next slide. This is what happens. Incoming information, you know, can you see the straight arrows? That is for normal people like you and me. Uh, we would, it would go into our sensory memory. It would go into our working memory. It would go into our long-term memory where we would encode it and retrieve it and use it. We would remember our appointments. We would do our therapy homework. We would practice our skills. Now imagine if you have a brain damage. Your brain isn't working like our brains. Look at it. Incoming information, sensory memory, you forget. Next level, you forget. Uh, you, you can't store it. And what happens is the cognitive load is too much that the person is fatigued, cannot follow the content, and pretty soon gives up. Because you don't understand what cognitive load is. Next slide. And here I'm giving you a really simple example of a filing cabinet. Input, so you are teaching a, a, a class on C cognitive behavioral therapy. You're giving them information on, on a mood, mood behavior, and thoughts. Say, uh, you have to pay attention and concentrate. Then you need to put it in your filing cabinet. You have to store it and retain that information. Then you have to retrieve it and use it. Now, see the steps? We do it seamlessly. When someone has a brain damage, it doesn't. doesn't happen seamlessly. It is every step of the way there are breakdowns. And if you're not adjusting and accommodating for that, uh, you will lose the battle right at the front end with cognitive overload. Next slide. So really, the bottom line is improvise, adapt improvise and adapt your practice for people with TBI. There's no other like magic bullet. Next slide. Here are some considerations. Just first of all, recognize and understand what is cognitive load. 
and ask these questions. What is expected from the treatment approach in terms of new learning that I'm going to be teaching? How can you assist your TBI client to have attention, uh, to, uh, to have attention or, or, or acquire information if they're having memory problems? Is orally presented information reinforced in writing? Is the environment noisy, busy, thus a source of distraction for clients who already have problems with attention? Is that a good place? How long are your treatment sessions? Do you have to accommodate by making them shorter so that you prevent that kind of cognitive overload? Do you present information in a way that allows for, uh, allows for a pace for slower information processing or you are boom, boom, boom saying I have 45 minute session, I need to cover all of this. So I'm just going to race through the material. And your client is lost after the first five minutes because they have a processing speed problem. So can you see? How important it is for you to understand the concept of cognitive load. Next slide. And adapting your interventions. Interventions should be introduced very with a very simple rationale. Minimize distractions like noise, light, crowds. Slow down the pace. Provide opportunities for them to ask you questions and to generate feedback. Always provide written materials and handouts of whatever you're teaching or communicating. Give it in writing. Repetition of key points. What are the key messages that you want them to remember and repeat it? And devices which include checklists, pictures, icons, photographic cues, post-it notes, journals, planners. That is the compensation. You know, I used to work with people with a serious mental illness and many of them also have low reading literacy. And so anytime I would create a plan for them, I would put it in writing and I would also put pictures. So they had both options to understand and reinforce what I was trying to teach. And pictures are easy to get, you know, if you're doing it on the curve, it's very easy to download photographs or even just cutting them out of, ma I, cutting them out of magazines, sticking them so that persons has both a pictorial uh, understanding and if they can read well, uh, they can look at the narrative you know many people with tbi get tired by the end of the day because they have to use so much cognitive bandwidth that their language gets affected they can't read because they're just so tired so sometimes just seeing the picture prompts them to remember what they're supposed to do next slide so as you can see there is no huge magic trick here these modifications aim to compensate for your client's cognitive deficits, which ultimately support retention and application of whatever you're teaching them. For example, shortening the time spent in therapy. That instead of a one hour session, making it 30 minute session and then repeating, repeating the key concepts using maybe a therapy notebook that you create with your client, incorporating visual aids, having them already in your office, you know, what are some visual aids that will help them identify what emotions they are feeling? And don't really use abstract metaphors and similes. Be very concrete because people with traumatic brain injury may not get kind of more complex metaphors, et cetera. So keep it simple and concrete. Next slide. And remember, one size does not fit all. So you may need to extend your assessment and preparation phase because it just takes longer to complete an intake session. You may want to actively involve caregivers in your sessions or in your intakes. 
you may have to change to use very concrete communication. Writing, pictures, videos, charts, all of that. You may have to change the length of your session. It could be shorter or longer. But remember, all of these adaptations are based on a person-centered plan where you've done a thorough assessment of what is it that your client needs. Next slide. For example, memory problems. Always give the stuff you're teaching or telling them about in writing. Always. That's a best practice. Use their telephones, smartphones, etc. for reminders, for, for of, uh, alarms, for reminders about appointments or things they have to do at home. That is compensation. Next slide. Uh, you know, I'm, I've given lots of uh, ideas here for you to incorporate. Uh, I'm not going to go over them because of time. Next slide. Uh, attentional difficulties. Maybe scheduling shorter sessions, looking at distraction so short sources, uh, short sentences to communicate ideas, gently prompting the client to attend if you see that they are their brain is wandering. Next slide. Remember slowed processing speed? Just slow down. Express one idea. Give time for your client to respond. Repeat the information if necessary. And always give it in writing. Next slide. Difficulty with language. So I have gone over all of this. I'm going to let you take a look at them. Uh, next slide, Angela. Again, just for communication in general, keep your message simple and concrete. Be sure that you're using a quiet space with very little distraction. Like sitting in a cubicle with 10 other people on the telephone may not be the best place to give key information to your client who's coming in for their case management session. Because they can't drown out that stimuli of 10 people talking. And keep your conversations linear as opposed to circuitous and in a riddle-like. Just keep them simple and linear for people with traumatic brain injury. Next slide. Again, problem solving gets deeply affected in traumatic brain injury, especially when the injury is in the front of your head, the frontal lobe. So identify and helping them think ahead to see what might happen. And sometimes it's very difficult for them to generate ideas. So give them some options. Hey, you can do this, this, and this. Which one is the one that you, you think you are most likely do, to do? And then build that problem-solving um, solution for them, which is a skill you're teaching them. And involve care partners in the th therapy session. Next slide. So we can go on to the next slide, um, Angela. So, so what treatments helps? So CBT, by the way, social skills training. And very recently, they've included mindfulness-based stress reduction approaches. All help people with, uh, with traumatic brain injury. As you can see, there's nothing new. It's the same things that we use with others that we will use with people with TBI, except we are going to accommodate for their disability. Next slide. So here are some tips for all of you behavioral health providers. Always try to read the neuropsychological evaluation if there is one and you can get your hands on it because that will really tell you what are their strengths and what are their weaknesses. And so it will help you better adapt. Again, I've always said use concrete examples, you know, talk in linear, direct fashion. Um, um, uh, so if, uh, you know, if visually impaired, um, you know, uh, or hearing impaired, be, uh, be certain to sit closer so they can hear you. Uh, in, when you're introducing a new information or concept, introduce it in very small increments and 
frequently repeat it. Encourage your client or their caregiver to take notes and complete worksheets so that they can recall it later. And keeping the sessions very structured. Remember when people have problems with attention and concentration, keeping it very structured is very important. Okay, next slide. And here I'm giving you more tips on how to uh, how to work with your uh, work with your client in some of sometimes in a group setting, though group is really not suggested for people with more significant traumatic brain injury because it's too distracting uh, group settings. Next slide. Uh, as I told you, CBD can absolutely be adapted for people with uh, with TBI. Uh, you know, it can involve role playing, uh, repetition as part of CBT. Uh, I also recommend recording the sessions if possible, or ev every phone you can record a session, or pre recording like relaxation um, um, relaxation therapy. You know, on on the on, on their smartphone. Also, people with serious uh, traumatic brain have a hard time generating ideas for pleasant activities. Remember, that's part of CBT. So you may have to help them with that, especially if they can no longer access those activities which they did before their interview. So don't get stuck on it. <coughs> and always, always use a therapy partner, whether it's a family member or a caregiver, and engage them in in therapy so that they can reinforce and follow up with therapy and therapy homework in at home. Next slide. And so, uh, you know, I've given you lots of information on CBT because, uh, you know, that's that's a modality which is very well tested and we all use it. Suffice is to say that it can absolutely be used with people with traumatic brain injury with accommodations. Next slide. And so here I'm giving you some ideas about how it can be accommodated. Uh, because of time, I'm going to skip this, uh, go on to the next slide. So therapy goals, you can first um, focus on things like sleep, hygiene, self-care, identification of pleasant activities. Uh, you can help the client challenge their should statements such as, I am supposed to be employed right now. I ought to remember everything. So gently challenging those, which is part of CBT work. Uh, Re-evaluating re one's values based on the type of person one is or one has become. So all of these are some tips for therapy goals for any of you who will provide actual counseling to, uh, to, uh, to people with TBI. Next slide. And so here are some other suggestions. Uh, you know, provide written handouts and notes on any material and homework exercises. Use technology such as smart so, smartphones as much as possible in your session and, and engaging caregivers to continue to use it when they go home. Uh, uh, um, thought records could include a list of possible emotions or thought that the client can just tick off as opposed to, uh, this is part of CBT, you know, where you have to keep a thought record. Uh, wh whereas them writing on a blank paper, giving them some options where they can just use a checkbox and say, hey, this is the thought I was having. Uh, slow down everything, uh, keeping cognitive load in mind all the time. And Again, I can't emphasize how important it is to engage a therapy partner in this, whether it's a family member or a uh, paid caregiver. Next slide. Uh, behavioral techniques are also very, very useful. Uh, relaxation, behavioral activation, insomnia treatments, all of them absolutely use them with people with traumatic brain injury and I have some good resources for you coming up on those. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, I'm going to skip this uh, to the next slide. And here are some very specific other techniques that I'm suggesting, problem solving, learning to recognize maladaptive thinking, especially those should, should statements. 
mindfulness based stress reduction relaxation training pleasant activity scheduling teaching how to appropriately seek social support and and you know uh, 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 therapies such as dbt and behavioral activation are really well suited for people with traumatic brain injury because they're very skill based absolutely you would need to adapt them Next slide. So my top 10 therapy modification, modifications, language, frequency of sessions, shorter sessions, duration of therapy, structured directive approach, communicating with collaterals such as family caregivers and paid caregivers, modifying the complexity of the intervention, being very supportive and like a coach, you being flexible, remember the person with the brain injury is less flexible and that you really need to coordinate your work very well with the rest of the team that may be serving this person with a brain injury. Next slide. So really the message is adapt, adapt, adapt. There's nothing new actually. Next slide. And so I'm just, go you can jump on to the next few, uh, you can move um, and move to the next one. And so really, uh, again, this is for you to think uh, later on, what have, what is one thing you've learned today and what is one thing you'll do differently in your practice when you go back. Next slide. And here are some resources, digital resources. We call them digital therapeutics. There are some fabulous ones, all free. Next slide. I would highly, highly recommend this. Uh, it is free to download. It's called Max Impact TBI Assistant. It's developed by the VA. It's absolutely free to download for you and for your client to use. Uh, Max Impact. And y'all will be getting this uh, PowerPoint. So all of these resources are in there. Next slide. Here is a CBTI, CBT for insomnia. Remember, sleep disturbance is very common in people with a traumatic brain injury. Uh, this is a free app again, uh, developed by the U.S. Uh, Department of Veterans Affairs, which you can download for yourself and for your client and for their care caregivers to use, adjunctive to any work that you are doing with them in the clinic. Next slide. Mindfulness coach, again, totally free. This is one of the uh, frontline uh, evidence-based practices for people with a traumatic brain injury is mindfulness. This is again, a free app from the VA, um, totally free for you and your TBI client to download. By the way, I have used this for non-TBI clients too. Uh, next slide. Uh, in Oregon, at the University of Oregon, we have the Center for Brain Injury Research and Training. That is their website. Please go there. They have tons of resources and training available to you uh, if you want to deepen your knowledge about TBI. I am on one of their uh, ACL advisory boards. Uh, so I do work with, with the Center for Brain Injury and Research. It's called CBERT. So please check them out. Next slide. Did you know Love Your Brain is a yoga and meditation program where they offer free six-week yoga for people with brain injury? It is only designed for people with brain injury. That's why it's called Love Your Brain. So please check it out if you want to bring it to your region of Southern Oregon. Next slide. Uh, here, for all of you who are maybe medical providers or licensed professionals here, uh, this is a fabulous resource, uh, Clinical Practice Guidelines, again, developed by the VA. Uh, please go and look at the uh, uh, Clinical Practice Guidelines in detailed uh, uh, details they have given you, what is first line, second line in terms of uh, uh, psycho psychotherapy, in terms of medications, in terms of adjunctive treatment. So please check out the clinical practice guidelines. Next slide. I would highly recommend this book. It is easily available on Amazon. 
uh, I this is my own book. I use it a lot in my consultation, which is basically they have taken DBT, especially emotion regulation skills and have adapted it for people who have neurocognitive disorders. It is developed by Julie F. Brown. It is a DBT informed uh, approach. Uh, again, I think it is $20 or something on Amazon. I own my own copy and have used it a lot over the years in my consultations. So I would highly recommend this. This is an excellent, excellent resource for any of you who are interested in knowing more about substance abuse. Uh, again, the book, uh, the, the, the SAMHSA uh, download is called Traumatic Brain Injury and Substance Use Disorder. Uh, you, you can absolutely download this for free. And it gives you detailed uh, interventions. Next slide. Here are all the other ton of resources that I use to prepare this, uh, this uh, talk. You're welcome to look at them. Next slide. I think uh, there are more here. And then the last slide, I think, is my thank you. Uh, I love this assume they're doing their very best. You know, sometimes we assume they're not doing their very best. And, and we want to, you know, prematurely end treatment. So even if your client is missing appointments, not doing the homework, assume they're trying to do their very best. Uh, if you begin with that assumption, I think we communicate hope and efficacy way better. We have, I think, uh, uh, three minutes for any comments or questions. I know I breeze through this just because of some of our technical difficulties. Our sincere apologies for all of you who logged on at nine and had to wait. You know, technology is technology. This has rarely happened to us, right? Both the Angelas and this is the first time. <laughs> yeah, and here we were sitting on at 8.45. We had actually logged on at 8 and wondering, where are the people? Why are they? Yeah, we were at the right place. Where were y'all? Yes, yes. So our sincere apologies. Uh, there is any comments or questions I'm willing to take very quickly. So, uh, uh, Angela's anything, uh, anything that we missed out on? Or is there anything in chat? Well, our no. own Angela Franklin uh, has something. I was uh, wondering, um, just based on my personal experience with some people with TBIs, is uh, a slight aversion to electronic devices. Um, and so I was wondering if there's any other correlations that you know of, of, uh, of that. So I didn't get it, electronic devices and? No, just electronic devices like uh, having a slight aversion to utilizing. Oh, having a slight aversion but yeah. from people with TBI? Yeah. Uh, I am not, you know, I, uh, I really haven't seen any research on, you know, any strong research. It, I mean, uh, there are lots of subpopulations who are aversive to technology. Uh, so I think there is, uh, I don't think there's anything in particular. I, these are just my assumptions uh, because mm -hmm. of brain disorder, except maybe they're having more difficulty now and using and navigating the functions uh, as opposed to, you know, prior to their injury. So really making the functionality as easy as possible, even writing down, you know, how to access this in three simple steps. Uh, so th that would just be my hunch uh, uh, that uh, that would Th that would be why it is aversive. Yeah. And I don't think that there's any other questions. If uh, someone would like to unmute, if they have a question, we just have a very short amount of time. And those who need to jump off, uh, you're welcome to jump off. And we'll be sending out our follow-up uh, emails within the next uh, few weeks for both part one and part two. Please check out those the digital therapeutics, they're actually fantastic, uh, even for you yourselves, you know, to see. Uh, so I, I use the CBTI coach a lot, uh, you know, for sleep problems uh, so to teach. Uh, and, and, and like Angela said, if there is a client who is having a hard, hard time navigating, actually helping download that, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, what you call it, app in your office, 
and then giving simple instructions on how to access it, both to them and perhaps to a caregiver or a, a therapy partner. So. So thank you all. I Again, our apologies. And please let Angela Franklin and Angela Jensen know of any follow-up training, even in these TBI series. You know, uh, I actually teach a class on behavioral activation. Uh, so how do we adapt behavioral activation for people with uh, TBI uh, or anything else, any other topics, please reach out to uh, uh, to both the Angelas and to Janine Greenwell in Jackson County if the, if you all are identifying a need for some other training. Uh, again, uh, again, I appreciate you all coming back to listen to me uh, for the second round. Uh, um, I'm hoping I've added uh, some uh, knowledge and skill uh, to, to what you already know, uh, working with uh, uh, people with um, traumatic brain injury. And one of my key messages today was to understand the concept of cognitive load and cognitive compensation, and that it is a a disability and a civil right for all of us to accommodate a how we deliver services to people with disabilities, whether it is a brain injury or some other disability. Thank you all. I'll see you whenever I see you next. Bye. <laughs>